Hey, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I want to talk about sediments and sedimentary rocks, clastic sedimentary rocks. In fact, Dex Perkins' online mineralogy book, his chapter seven covers this material quite well. So the basic outline here is I want to talk about processes of weathering and transport, spend some time talking about clay structure and chemistry, classification of clastic sediments, and then briefly discuss diagenesis. And I'll explain what diagenesis is later. So at the end of this lecture, I hope students will be able to say something about the sedimentary rock cycle, predict the susceptibility of minerals to chemical weathering, say something about clay minerals in general with respect to their structure and chemistry, be able to categorize clastic sediments, and then talk about how diagenesis converts a sediment into a sedimentary rock. So sedimentary rocks cover a large portion of Earth's surface, although it's a tiny fraction of Earth's crust, and they're generally formed by burial of sediments, so these would be clastic sediments, or chemical precipitation. I'm not going to talk about chemical precipitation in this lecture. That will be a subsequent lecture. The basic process is that you start with a source region, which is weathered and eroded, that material is transported downslope and deposited in some system. That sediment then undergoes diagenesis to form a sedimentary rock. And of course, those sedimentary rocks can be uplifted and exposed to start this cycle all over again. You can see a whole range of compositions depending on what the source rock is. The process also depends very sensitively on climate and topography. So you'll see very different sediments forming in, say, the Amazon rainforest, which is hot and wet and has very little topography, as opposed to sediments that are being deposited in, say, an alpine system at high elevation where it's cold and there's not very much precipitation and not very many plants. Several different possible agents of transport. Wind can form sand dunes, ice can form moraines, gravity can form talus fields and slumps. But most sediments are transported and deposited by water, either streams or lakes or in the ocean. Chemical weathering is an incredibly important process. It basically decomposes minerals. And this decomposition changes the chemical composition of the sediment, and it often also alters the mineralogy. Very generally, minerals that form at high temperature and pressure are more likely to be altered at Earth's surface than minerals that form at lower temperature or lower pressure. So the stability of a mineral at Earth's surface generally depends on the temperature and pressure at which it first crystallizes. Water is the most significant agent for altering and transporting material, but biology matters too, and the effects of lichen here or trees and other sorts of plants can be significant in weathering rocks. Okay, quick question here. Which of the following minerals do you think would weather fastest at Earth's surface? And the answer is olivine. Like I said, higher temperature, higher pressure minerals tend to be less stable and alter faster than lower temperature minerals. So quartz is stable at Earth's surface, so it's not very susceptible to weathering. Olivine is the highest temperature mineral among this group, and so it would tend to weather the fastest. There are several different types of chemical weathering or decomposition. Dissolution is one of the simplest ones. For example, if we take salt and put it in water, it dissolves. In fact, there are salt deposits. When they get exposed near the surface, they can simply dissolve. The sodium and chlorine enter into solution and end up in the ocean. There are other sorts of dissolution reactions. So for example, we can take calcite and react it with carbonic acid, which is a common acid in solution, and it will dissolve to form calcium as an aqueous anion plus bicarbonate as a, an aqueous anionic complex. Hydrolysis is simply reacting a mineral with water to form new minerals, and so a really common one is to take feldspar, so this is potassium feldspar, with some stuff in water, some of it is just water, but there can be a positively charged hydrogen ion here, 
and that can react to form kaolinite. Kaolinite is a clay and some other stuff that's dissolved in water, silicic acid here and potassium in solution. There are also reactions that simply add water to a crystal structure. So for example, there is the mineral anhydrite, which is CaSO4, calcium sulfate, and it reacts with water to produce gypsum. Gypsum is a different mineral that has structural water within it. Similarly, there can be changes to the structures of minerals if we take smectite, which is a type of clay, and we dry it out, it has a collapsed structure. When we add water to it, it swells and makes wet smectite. This changes its physical properties and can have an impact on slope stability. Oxidation is simply when minerals react with oxygen. Also, they can react with water simultaneously. So if we take olivine, this is phaolite, and we react it with water and oxygen, we can form hematite, a new oxide mineral, plus silicic acid, which is in solution and flows away from the system. And here, for example, is a lava flow in India that has been weathered to form these red oxides and oxyhydroxides. And then last, there can be carbonation. So minerals can react with dissolved CO2, carbon dioxide, to form carbonates. This is one of the ways that we find sedimentary rocks that are cemented with calcite. So here's a question for you. Which of the following materials is not likely to react with minerals? And the answer here is nitrogen. We talked about carbon dioxide, water, oxidation reactions. Nitrification turns out to be extremely inefficient, although it does happen in some biological systems. So depending on the type of reaction, a precursor mineral that's exposed at the surface can react to form different product minerals. Here, for example, is a hydrolysis reaction where olivine, this is forsterite, plus water, reacts to form serpentine and brucite. Here's a carbonation reaction of this same mineral. So we can take olivine and react it with carbon dioxide to form magnesite plus silica. This can be amorphous silica, meaning it doesn't have a crystal structure, or it could also crystallize to form quartz. This is actually an important reaction that people are considering for CO2 sequestration to bring down the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Or it can simply dissolve. So if we take olivine plus CO2 and H2O in solution, we can dissolve it to form a magnesium ion, a bicarbonate ion, and silicic acid. And these simply flow away from wherever the olivine is being dissolved. The ability of a mineral to survive weathering depends on the resistance of the mineral, which is its chemical stability. The rate of decomposition, that depends on the climate, things like temperature and precipitation. And the duration of decomposition, how long is it exposed at the surface before it either gets transported to a new environment or gets covered up by different sediments. In general, though, clastic rocks tend to accumulate highly resistant minerals that survive weathering, things like quartz, iron, and aluminum oxides. And minerals that dissolve or weather easily don't normally survive. So these are things like salts or high temperature mafic minerals. People have put together tables that describe the resistivity of minerals with respect to weathering. So for example, iron oxides and aluminum hydroxides are extremely stable at Earth's surface. They really do not tend to weather at all. Whereas as we move down, we get to higher temperature minerals and ultimately into things like salts that are very, very unstable at Earth's surface. Now, you may notice that the weatherability of minerals kind of follows Bowen's reaction series. And that's exactly right. As I said before, high temperature minerals are chemically unstable in low temperature environments, so they react very readily. Olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, and biotite tend to be very unstable at Earth's surface. Potassium feldspar is moderately stable, and quartz is very, very stable. 
Within the plagioclase feldspars, calcium feldspars react very quickly at Earth's surface. Sodium feldspars will react with time, but they're less susceptible to reactions than calcium feldspar. And so the susceptibility table really largely reflects Bowen's reaction series. Okay, with that in mind, which of the following materials would be least susceptible to weathering? And the answer is quartz. Quartz is stable at Earth's surface. Micas can persist, especially muscovite, but the others react very quickly. So at this point, I hope students would be able to say something about the sedimentary rock cycle and then talk about the susceptibility of minerals to chemical weathering. Okay, I'd like to spend a little time talking about clays. These are very commonly formed by chemical weathering. They have a sheet structure, and there are two kinds of clays that can form. Some have a single tetrahedral and octahedral sheet bonded together, so a TO sheet. Others have a TOT sheet, and then these sheets are held together by various materials. They can be interstitial cations, so this would actually look a lot like a mica, or they can be held together with hydrogen bonds or interstitial water. So these are all aluminum-bearing phyllosilicates, sheet silicates, and the different clays depend on how these sheets are stacked and whether there is an interlayer cation. So here, for example, is simply an octahedral tetrahedral sheet, octahedral tetrahedral sheet held together with hydrogen bonds. Here is a TOT sheet held together to the next TOT sheet with interstitial water. And here are TOT sheets that are held together with interstitial potassium. And so these correspond to different clays. Kaolinite is held together with hydrogen bonds. Illite are TOT sheets held together with interlayer potassium. And smectite and vermiculite are expanding clays. These are clays that are held together with interstitial water, but this water can be driven off if the clays are dried out, and then this whole structure collapses so that it shrinks. And there are various different kinds of clays. Kaolinite is the simple TO layer. Illite looks actually a lot like muscovite. And then there are these various other more chemically complicated clays. Smectite is the general term that is used, but you will also find, especially in the industrial literature, references to montmorillonite and bentonite. And here's what some of these things look like. So this is kaolinite, has a structure very similar to serpentine, in fact, except it's a dioctahedral sheet silicate, not a trioctahedral sheet silicate. This is what illite looks like. This is what a smectite looks like. And just to expand a little bit on how these sheets are held together, we can take a very similar structure, and if there's no water layer here, it's the mineral kaolinite, but if there is a water layer, it's the mineral holoisite. And similarly for these other options for holding sheets together. So pyrophyllite has no interstitial cation, smectite has water, vermiculite has water plus magnesium, illite has potassium. And then there's also what are called mixed layer clays or mixed layer sheet silicates where the interstitial horizon can contain variable materials. One can contain potassium, another might contain water and so on. Okay, structure of clays is most like which of the following minerals? And the answer is micas. Clays are either TOT, which is like muscovite, a mica, or they're like TO sheet silicates, like serpentine. So at this point, I hope you have a better understanding of the structure and chemistry of clay minerals. Now, how do we classify clastic sediments? Well, first of all, let's define clastic. Clastic means made of clasts. What does that mean? Clasts are fragments of pre-existing rock. And this can include literally rock fragments, but also typically mineral grains. And it implies some sort of transport, which is usually by water, but can also be by air to form sand dunes and so on. And clastic rocks are classified according to grain size. So conglomerates have grain sizes that are greater than two millimeters in diameter. 
sandstone, 62 microns to two millimeters. Siltstones are four to 62 microns in diameter, and claystones are grains less than four microns in diameter. There are other classifications for clasts. A granule has a size of two to four millimeters. A pebble is technically four to 64 millimeters. A cobble is 64 to 256 millimeters, and a boulder is greater than 256 millimeters. But once grains are above two millimeters, we simply refer to that rock as a conglomerate. And when I say that the rock has that grain size, rocks can have many, many different grain sizes in them. This is referring to the dominant grain size. So here, the dominant grain size in this rock is greater than two millimeters, so this would be a conglomerate. Here, it's sand size, so it's a sandstone. It's also a sandstone. And this is very fine grain, so this would be a claystone. One of the most important concepts for understanding clastic sediments is how sediments are transported. So this is a diagram, it's called a Hulstrom diagram, which shows velocity on a log scale, centimeters per second, versus grain diameter. So this is, what, 10 microns? That would be a micron down here. So clays are in this region. 10 microns, 10th of a millimeter, one millimeter, 10 millimeters, 10th of a meter, 10 centimeters. And what this diagram blocks out are areas where grains would be deposited so flow rates are not fast enough to transport them, a region where flow rates are fast enough to transport them, and a region where erosion can occur. So first let's look at the larger grain sizes. This variation between erosion, transport, and deposition makes intuitive sense. If you want to erode a surface that has clasts that are 10 centimeters across, you have to have a very high flow rate. As the flow rate drops, you can transport them. You may not be eroding them, but not depositing them. But if the flow rate drops below a certain level, then those clasts are going to drop out of the flow regime and those clasts will be deposited. And so it makes intuitive sense that as the flow rate decreases, the grain size that is able to be transported or deposited also steadily decreases. The increase in flow rate required to erode a bed for small grain sizes is a reflection of two factors. The first is that clays tend to stick together, so it's pretty hard to move them apart. It's like when you put flour into your sink and you try to wash that away. It takes a surprisingly large amount of force to move that stuff because it tends to stick together. But the other reason is that water forms a viscous sublayer that's about a tenth of a millimeter to a millimeter in thickness. And so if grains are smaller than that, they don't stick up into the turbulent region. They're stuck in this viscous region. And so it's pretty hard to actually move them. You have to actually increase the velocity substantially to move them because you just can't get the flow to penetrate down to the actual bed surface. So which of these materials do you think would be hardest to move? Not a road, but just simply to transport. And the answer is boulders. If you want to just transport them, this would be the minimum velocity to transport these. And boulders, which are actually off the top of this diagram, would require the highest velocity to transport. But now let's think about erosion. Which of the following would be hardest to erode? And the answer here turns out to be clay. So this is this inversion in the Hulstrom diagram, and it's simply that clay particles, which are down here, are very cohesive, and they're very far below the turbulent region of water flow. Now, sometimes you will find clay chips in clastic rocks. These are called rip-up clasts, and that's when the flow manages to get under a layer and sort of blow it apart. And then those chips then enter the stream and are deposited in other sedimentary layers. Classic sediments are also classified according to maturity. A mature sediment means it's been transported a lot, and an immature sediment means it has not been transported very much. 
transport breaks up weak grains and it also sorts all the grains to a common grain size. So materials that are well sorted all have very similar grain sizes. Materials that are not well sorted have a wide range of grain sizes. This process tends to remove rock fragments and materials that are easily cleaved like feldspars and micas and it leaves behind quartz and other non-cleavable materials like zircon or magnetite or tourmaline. Also, the corners get worn off, so we end up with grains that are very round. There are also chemical effects. Dissolution and reprecipitation, reaction to produce other minerals, tends to favor the chemically resistant minerals, which turn out to be quartz, zircon, tourmaline, not really mafic minerals like olivines and pyroxenes. So here's an example of a very mature sediment. This is almost all quartz, these clear grains that are all nicely rounded, all pretty similar in grain size. And that is as contrasted with an immature sediment like this, which has this olivine crystal here, a bunch of different rock fragments, angular grains, and a wide range of grain sizes. So let's run through some typical clastic rocks. A very common classic rock is a shale, which is a fine-grained detrital. Detrital just means it's been deposited. And it has a tendency to fracture along bedding planes. Sometimes we'll call something a mudstone, which is a mixture of silt and clay. That's essentially what a shale is. But we can then distinguish a mudstone or shale from a siltstone, which is silty, or a claystone, which is clayey. An argillite is a claystone, but it doesn't have a tendency to fracture along planes. So this claystone is actually an argillite. We distinguish shales from slates. Slates are incipiently metamorphosed, and they have what's called a slaty cleavage, which is typically in an angle to the bedding planes. One way to tell a slate from a shale is using the clink-clunk test. So if you tap a shale, on a tabletop, it tends to go clunk. And if you tap a slate on a tabletop, it tends to clink. And the clinking is just indicating that it's more crystalline. The rock cleavage that we see, the separation of slates into plates, actually reflects the preferred orientation of clay minerals. And the stratification, the different layers in shales and these other fine-grained rocks is very, very thin. Typical minerals in shales are clays, lots of quartz, typically some feldspar, and then various materials that can cause them to have different colors. So for example, gray shales are almost entirely clay minerals. They're very common. But we can also see red shales that have hematite or gertite, which is an iron oxyhydroxide. There are lots of black shales that have abundant organic matter. They often have iron sulfides in them. And we can also see silicious or calcareous shales. And those usually have material that's added into the clay material, either silicious microfossils or calcareous microfossils. Sandstones. Sandstones contain mostly quartz, feldspar, or rock fragments. In fact, there's a whole classification scheme that's based on the proportions of those. Some of these are going to be primary, meaning they're part of the original sediment, and other components in the rock can be secondary. So these could be precipitated clays or carbonates or quartz. Some really common sandstones that we encounter are gray wackies. Gray wackies have approximately equal proportions of quartz, feldspar, and rock fragments. So on a quartz, feldspar, rock fragment diagram, gray wackies in most muds actually, tend to fall in this region. They tend to be kind of gray-green and immature, meaning they have lots of rock fragments and are quite angular. And they tend to form in tectonically active areas, especially where there are trenches, deep marine settings. Arcoses have substantial feldspar and are essentially mixtures of feldspar and quartz. And aronites are quartz-rich sandstones. So a lot of beach deposits are going to be quartz-rich sandstones because they have undergone a lot of weathering and transport, which winnows away all of the other weaker or more reactive crystals to leave behind quartz. And so here are some kind of 
typical pictures that we might see. So this is in fact a, a quartz aronite sand, well sorted, well rounded. They tend to form in beaches versus a lithic aronite. A lithic aronite is something that has a lot of rock fragments and it tends to be in areas that have a lot of tectonic uplift. We can also talk about where conglomerates form. These require high current velocities because the clasts are very large and typically there's high relief. This can occur in rivers or beaches, high relief talus slopes, or sometimes in deep marine canyons. Okay, so what sediment characteristics would you predict for a tectonically passive environment? So this is a region that's very stable. And the answer is rounded. I would expect there to be a lot of transport, and so many of the grains would be rounded, not angular, not so poorly sorted. It is true that you can find coarse grains in certain passive margins, but typically what we see are these well-rounded, mature sediments. So at this point, I hope students have a basic understanding of how to categorize clastic sediments, both in terms of grain size and then also their maturity and proportions of quartz, feldspar, and rock fragments. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is diagenesis. My definition of diagenesis is basically everything that happens that turns a sediment into a sedimentary rock. There are many different processes. There's the physical alteration of grains. They can crack or they can bend and deform. They can compact so they reorient themselves so there's less pore space. Old minerals can dissolve because they're chemically unstable. There's also a process of pressure solution. Pressure solution occurs because some minerals are more soluble at higher pressure than lower pressure. So they can dissolve in areas of high pressure and that same material, quartz in this case, can migrate around and precipitate in areas of low pressure. So here's the boundary of an original quartz grain. This is new orthogenic quartz that has precipitated around it. That's a diagenetic phenomenon. And then the materials that precipitate can be quartz, as in this case. There are other sorts of cements. There can be carbonates, calcite or siderite, or there can be oxides like hematite. And last, there can be various other kinds of reaction or alteration of some of the detrital materials. Glass can react to form clays or zeolites. End member feldspars can form from other more intermediate feldspars. Various ions can be mobilized. There are lots of very interesting temperature-dependent phenomena as well. Vitrinite reflectance, which is the reflectance of carbonaceous material, is a measure of temperature. That's something that we call the coal rank. Fluids can be included in some of these orthogenic materials, and we can see the temperatures at which those were entrapped. And then there's the conodont coloration index or conodont alteration index. Conodonts are mineralogically appetite. They represent worm teeth. And the color of the conodont microfossil depends on the temperature that the rock reached. So higher temperatures, conodonts become darker and darker and darker until eventually they become black. That is up to a certain temperature. If temperature increases above that, there are conodonts that have been recovered from metamorpho sediments, and these actually turn back to clear again. So they start out at low temperature as relatively clear. They become yellow and orange and dark brown and then black, and then they alter back to being clear again with increasing temperature. Okay, so which of the following processes would you not expect to happen during diagenesis? And the answer here is bioturbation. Bioturbation or burrowing occurs only in the near surface within sediments. It does not happen during diagenesis as sediments are turned into rocks. Okay, so I hope that this final section provides a foundation for students to understand how diagenesis alters source sediments and contributes to the lithification of sediments to form rocks. All right, thanks.